Make sure that you're here and, and bring your, your family members. We have our brother Joey uh, with us this moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God bless you all. God bless you all. Is this on? I don't know. This is the first time I use this Madonna mic. Sit, sit down, please. Be seated. Be seated. We're going to stand up and we're going to read God's words shortly. Uh, thank you, Pastor, for that introduction. I feel like I should take him with me on all my interviews. That was great. That was really nice. Over the past year, right, we've been discussing what it means to form. Hey, guys, is this in the, in the monitors or? Yeah, it's like, no, it's like coming back a lot. So over the past few years, for over the past year, we've been discussing what it means to formulate, right, and to discover what vision is, right? By the end of the year, we're going to be visioned out, right? Like we've been talking about the vision so much. But how many know that the work that we're doing to clarify it is a good work? How many know that? That it's a good work, right? So today, I'm tasked with talking about what it is about that vision that makes it holistic, right? The title of today's message is The Holistic Vision. Now, holistic is one of these words, right, that gets used, like, a lot. And, like, it can lose some of its, like, potency, right? And you can, like, forget what it means. There's, like, holistic candles, holistic spas, right? But holistic, right, means a couple of things, right? In the medical field, holistic is like the treatment of the whole person, right? Taking into consideration mental, social factors, not just the symptoms. But in philosophy, and I think I wrote the definition up here, we're going to lean towards this definition a little bit. Holistic is characterized by the comprehension of the parts of something as intimately interconnected and explicable only by reference to the whole, right? That seems complicated, but basically it's, there's a big picture, right? And this big picture, big picture is made up of different parts, right? And it gets hard to see the big picture without understanding the parts that create the foundation for it, right? So this morning, I'm tasked with talking to you about the parts that make up that vision. And we have as our anchor verse, Mark 12, 28 through 31, right? And it's going to be up here, and we're going to get up in just a second. But my fear with like verses like this is that our thinking about them can become abstract, right? To the extent that what we know about the heart, soul, mind, and strength is largely informed like by the world around us, right? So this morning, I'd like you to humor me as we like walk through the text, right? To see what it is that God says about the heart, soul, mind, and strength. And my hope is that once we have a scriptural basis for these, we're going to understand how they create the foundation for vision. Yes? Let's stand up. We have the blueprint before us. Amen? Let's read together. Okay? Amen. You should know this verse by heart because we've been talking about it literally every day, every Sunday, right, for the past year. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he had answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning that you've given us, Father, for the privilege of being here and talking about your word, Lord. And we know that scattered around the globe, there are brothers and sisters right now that are worshiping in secret, Father, that are reading your word in secret, Father. But here in this country, we have the privilege, Lord, to just worship you in public, Father, to learn of your word, Lord. Father, I ask you, Lord, to, to keep over this message, Lord. I submit myself to your spirit. The people submit themselves to your voice. Speak, Father, for your people are listening. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. All right, so the first half of this message is kind of like Bible studies, right? I'm going to throw out a lot of verses at you. If you're like a note-taking person, don't stress out. What I'd like you to do is just let these verses wash over you. Delight in God's Word this morning, and I can send you a PDF of all the verses sometime during the week. Are we all right with that? Let's start at the heart of the matter, right? Uh, you know, pun intended, right? And when I talk about the heart, 
for a second, I'm not really talking about the organ, right? The vital blood pumping organ that we need. But I'm talking about the core of who we are. The Bible presents the heart as sort of like the center, right? A control center from which our desires and our motivations flow forth, right? That's how the Bible presents the heart. Worldly ideology, though, surrounding the heart has always viewed the heart as like a mechanism of the romantic, right? A mechanism of romance. The ancient Greeks in the lyric poetry identified the heart with love. Going back to like the 7th century before Christ, this is how the ancient Greeks associated the heart with love. The Romans, right, going a little further in history, they had like gods and goddesses, right? One of them was Venus, right? She was said to like set hearts on fire and she, she did that by the help of her son, right? Mr. Cupid, right? And the Romans had this curious belief when I was doing my research. They had this really interesting belief that doesn't really hold up anything here, but they believed that there was like a vein that ran from this finger all the way to the heart, right? Completely false, right? But that thinking went all the way to like medieval Europe and in England, like in Salisbury, the groom was told to put the ring right on his bride's finger right here. And to this day, you married folks wear this ring here because of faulty anatomical Roman studies. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, so they called it la vena amoris, right? So not true. There's no vein that runs. It'd be nice, but not true. So we can see right throughout history how we've inherited sort of like this ideology about the heart that says what? Follow your heart. That sounds so nice and it sounds so romantic. Follow your heart. Follow your heart has become, there's like modern iterations of it too for the young people. It's like, do you, do you, right? Follow your heart. So this has become like the rallying cry of generation after generation that believe that following the whims and impulses of your heart is like the most logical way to do life. But what does the word say? Yeah? Let's look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah was one of the major prophets in the Bible. He went throughout all of Israel preaching and announcing, hey, hey, God's judgment is coming because you keep doing the wrong thing over and over again. So this is what Jeremiah did all throughout Israel. He actually lived to see his prophecies come true, right? God's prophecies through him. Uh, the is Israel was exiled into Babylon. Let's read. The heart is deceit. Now, these highlights are mine. You won't see them in your Bible. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, 9. That doesn't sound like something we should be following, right? Well, now, deceitful was like bad enough, right? That's why I highlighted deceitful. But God, through the prophet Jeremiah, goes all the way to emphasize not only is your heart deceitful, but it's deceitful above all other things that try to trip you up. All things, right? The Bible warns us against like false prophets, right? Which is, right, we have to be careful, right? Sometimes they make their way to pulpits, right? If we're not careful, right? But they got nothing on your heart's ability to lure you into situations that you think are cool at the moment, but will lead you to death. Your heart is deceitful above all things. Why? Oh, sorry. That's my daughter. Uh, your heart is deceitful above all things. We're going to look at Psalms now, right? This is a prayer that comes right on the heels. Everybody knows King David, right? Right on the heels of this egregious sin, right? Nathan comes up to him, reprimands him. Do we know this story? David was like on a roof. He sees Bathsheba, a woman that wasn't his wife, bathing. He sends some of his goons to go get her, and uh, he lays with her, and she gets pregnant because of this, right? Uh, it's interesting. A lot of uh, even our books frame this story as like adultery. It, it wasn't, guys. When a king summons his a woman, right? Is there much choice there, right? We have to start to read into the text, right? So this is like an egregious sin, and this prayer comes right on the heels of this sin, right? Let's read. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Sin leads to an impure heart, right? For David, this acknowledgement and prayer comes, right, after he had done something crazy, right? But none of us, how many know none of us are exempt, right? These verses aren't going to be up here, right? But the Bible tells us that we are all born into sin, right? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? Before being made alive in Christ, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.3 that we were by nature 
children of wrath or children under wrath. Jesus tells Nicodemus in John 3, 3, that unless one is born again, one cannot see the kingdom of God. Create in me a clean heart, right? By implication, to ask God to like create something in us is to acknowledge that without God's intervention, what? It's absent from our lives, right? It's absent from our lives. The heart is deceitful because the heart in its natural state is impure, yeah? So what can we do? If this is the state of our hearts, right? Proverbs, let's look at Proverbs. And thank you to the guys in the back helping me out. Proverbs. Proverbs is written by Solomon, right? Solomon the wise. It's a collection of moral advice and counsel. Uh, and this is probably one of the best things that Solomon wrote, right? What does he write? Keep, right? Or guard in other translations your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life, right? Guard. In other translations, it says vigilance or diligence. You get the sense that what Solomon is saying is, hey, hey, always be watching out for your heart. Always be watching. How do we guard our hearts, right? Very practically speaking, like we're all deceptible, right, to certain temptations. We should be careful the places, the moments, maybe even some of the people, right, that would lead us into those things, right? We should be guarding ourselves from that. Very practically speaking, this is what Jesus says, right, when he uh, shares how we should pray. What does he say? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We should always be on guard for our hearts, right? And if we are, there's a great promise. The last verse for this section, there's a great promise, and pastor has been going through the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed is the pure in heart, for they will see God. Wow. Your heart has the capacity to lead you astray or lead you right into the presence of God of God. That's the power that your heart has. Yes? Yeah? Let's go to the next one. Soul. Soul. Different soul. I wrote, I worked on this section last because like the soul is the hardest to sort of wrap our minds around, right? The Bible is not perfectly clear as to the nature of the soul, but we can draw out some conclusions about it and implications, right? And the first point we want to make is that the Bible, in the Bible, right, the term spirit and soul are used interchangeably, right? Pastor mentioned that a couple weeks back. And it's why he's also mentioned that the soul is the seedbed of our emotions, right? Because when the Bible talks like spirit or soul, it's usually in the context of emotions, yeah? The first, is, the first implication we want to draw out, right, is that we all have a soul. We are both body and soul. Like the big theological term for that is dichotomy, which just means we have a body and we have a soul. Let's look at Genesis. Let's look at Genesis. Everything that we say here, we always want to what? back it up with Bible, right? Genesis. So here we find Rachel. Rachel was the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, one of uh, Jacob's wives, yeah? And right here we find her dying of childbirth. This is where we find her in the text. Then they journeyed from Bethel. When they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel went into labor, and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, don't worry, you're going to have a son. You know, as, as if she could just, like, die after that, right? And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. The first thing that jumped out at me at this text was like, that seems like the wrong time to veto like your wife's name choice, right? She's dying. That really, he could have waited, could have waited, right? But I use this text to, to highlight that, and that's her soul was departing. Where was her body? Her body was right there, right? Wherever she was, bed, ground, her body was there but her soul was departing. We are both body and soul. You with me? Not losing anybody? Implication number two, the soul is the part of our existence that engages with the spiritual. It's the part of who we are that engages with the spiritual. And I used Romans, Romans 8.16 for this. This is a great verse. The Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Your soul is what is able to engage with the spiritual, yeah? I don't have this verse up here, right? But another one is Psalms 84.2, my soul longs, yes, 
faints for the courts of the Lord. A soul that is submitted unto God is a soul that desires to be in his presence. Third implication, and this one is probably the most like sobering and like amazing. Your soul will last forever. Your soul has no end, right? Our bodies will, if Jesus tarries, all of us, shocker, will die. Your soul has no end, right? Uh, plenty of verses that I could have chose to highlight that, but remember on Calvary, Jesus is on the cross, right? And the thief next to him repents genuinely. What does Jesus tell him? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Their bodies were like hours from dying, and the thief's body, not Jesus, but the thief's body was a few days from decay. But Jesus says, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Our souls will last forever. Everybody that ever lived in history, their soul is in existence somewhere. This is sobering and this is amazing stuff, right? For those that have placed their trust in God, this is a remarkable reality. You will spend eternity with Jesus. How many are happy this morning that our souls will spend eternity with Jesus? The sobering part, for those that have rejected God's salvation, there will be no rest for their souls, right? One final point, uh, but first, when I was like 9 or 10, this is story time, tuck yourselves in. When I was like 9 or 10 years old, a call comes into my household, right? Uh, I was a sister from the church, Hermana Sofia, and this was normal for my household to have like men and women call because my dad to this day remains a man that could give you sound, godly counsel, right? Peppered with a little street smarts from his gangster days before Jesus. Um, he's just a guy that you want to be talking to. He can walk you through things. So this call comes in, very normal. My dad, you know, hangs up and he goes, Joey, go get dressed. Again, I was nine or ten. This is really normal. He took me with him to groceries, to visit the sick at the hospitals, to visit the elderly at nursing homes. Like, this was normal for me to go with him everywhere. Like, I was thinking about this. I was like, not so much in my house, right? Usually my wife will be like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell her like, uh, hon, I'm going to go to the groceries. You know, I'll be right back. And she goes, okay, hon, love you. Take Luke. Hon, I'm already in the supermarket parking lot. Like, I'm not taking that kid. Um, uh, but he, ta but he, takes me, he takes me with him every single place, right? And, uh, and we go to Amana Sofia's house, right? And as soon as I get into that apartment, I knew... This was not the outing I should have come along, right? Because what I didn't know at the time was that Amana Sofia's son was battling, at the moment, some sort of possession. And I'm not an expert in demonic possession. Uh, and he was about in his 40s. Don't think like this five-year-old was like bugging out. He was like in his 40s, right? Because Amana Sofia was well, in, well advanced in age, right? So this is like we're like in the middle of it, right? And I want to believe that my dad didn't have all the details when he took that phone call because that was the roughest ministry training he could have ever put me through, right? But this is happening. Stuff is happening in the room that I can't decipher. I don't understand the sounds that are coming out of that, out of there. My dad goes, Joey, go sit at the couch, you know? And I give him this look like, I was really into different strokes, right? Give him like, what are you talking about, Willis looks, right? Like, we got to get out of here, you crazy? So, so he tells me, Joey, go sit down on the couch, right? And I go sit down on this plastic-covered couch, thinking I didn't think this could get worse, right? But I'm sitting on this plastic-covered couch, and my dad goes into the room, and uh, he does what he does. He's praying, and I don't remember. Amana Sofia comes up to me. This is the only thing I remember her saying, Joey, quiero una galletita. And I'm like, this doesn't seem like the time for cookies. Like, but okay, but I took them anyway, right? I needed something to do. Um, so he, my dad goes to the room, and he's praying over this man. And, uh, and I'm here to tell the story, right? So there was deliverance there. I wonder where he is today, right? This man was in his 40s. Why do I say this story? Right, right. Uh, Ephesians 6.12. Why do I mention this? Ephesians 6.12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. There is a 24-hour, seven days a week, 365 days a year war that rages for your soul's attention and ultimately for its destruction. 24-7 war. And sometimes we walk and we don't know what's going on, right? Guard your soul, right, with the armor of God. That's why I bring up that story, lighthearted story. But that man in that room was battling something. 
because there's a war that rages. And that's not to scare you. It's to keep you on guard. There's a promise here, right? 2 Corinthians 10.4, I don't think I put this up. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, For the weapons of our warfare, our warfare, are not of flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Destroy strongholds. Submit your souls unto the God, right? There's a war that rages for it, right? Be on the right side. Yes? Yes? Mind, the mind. Are we good? We're like halfway through these. The mind. Where's my nice graphic? You're awesome. You're awesome. The mind, the mind. The mind is my favorite one to talk about, um, and uh, it's kind of the easiest one for me to understand, right? And the mind is a place, Pastor gave us little blurbs, right, these introductions uh, a couple weeks back, is a place where we find our rationality, our intellect, it's where we perceive. So let's go to Romans 12.2, it's the OG of mind verses. It's like the one that everybody quotes, and let's break it down a little bit, yeah? Romans 12.2 do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Yes, amen. The word for transformation is used in one other time, right, in the Gospels. It's the next slide. It's metamorphos. You Greek scholars could probably read that better, or if there's someone here Greek, right? metamorphos, right? The same word used in that text, it's used again in the Gospels uh, for the story of the transfiguration. How many know the story of the transfiguration? What a great story. In it, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, three of his disciples, to the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Or the Mount of Transformation. And before them, he appears radiant in glory, right? Shining and radiant. It's like it's one of these recorded miracles in the Bible, and it's this beautiful moment, right, where, and Moses and Elijah, right, they come, they stand beside him. It's this beautiful moment where heaven meets earth, and Jesus is presented as a bridge between both, right? And why do I bring that up? Because for Jesus, right, this external transformation was a result of the internal reality of who he was. Jesus was, is God. And the radiance that emanated from him was a result of his divinity, right? Encounters with the divine will do this. Remember Moses, Mount Sinai, he comes back, and his face, right, was almost shining because he was in the presence of God. Well, here's the thing, and here's the thing that a lot of us probably need to hear this morning. Your external transformation is only sustainable when there's internal transformation, right? That's why, like, that's why legalism, a lot of us know what legalism is. We grew up under it or hearing about it or critiquing it, right? It's just like this hyper-focus on rules and regulations. Legalism is an inadequate structure or framework for Christian living. Why? You can listen and adhere to any list that you want to, all the rules and all the regulations. But if you haven't let God grab hold of you here or here, in time the rebellion that's inside of you won't let you listen to any more lists. It won't let you listen to any more lists. Your external transformation is only sustainable when there's been an internal change, right? When there's been a change in your affections, a change in your desires, right? That's why I bring this up. So we know how the soul and the heart play a role in our transformation. We talk a lot about that, right? Our hearts have to be transformed. Our soul has. But here Paul's telling us that your mind also plays a role in your transformation. Why does our mind need renewal? What is the problem of our minds? Let's look at Ephesians 4, 17, 22, uh, 4, 17, and then we're going to jump to 22 through 23. Now this I say, and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and check this out, this is still Paul writing, and be renewed in the spirit of of your minds. What in the world is that? The spirit of your minds. Here's the thing. Your mind doesn't only have the ability to think and to perceive, but the mind clearly has a posture, right? Not only is it deficient in what it can take in, but it's deficient in the direction that it yields. Yes, the mind has a posture. Just like everything else, the mind is fallen, the mind is fallen, just like everything else, yeah? Let's look at Romans 1, 28. 
And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased, other versions are going to say depraved mind, to do what ought not to be done. Our rejection of God leads to a mind in opposition to God. Yes? Our rejection of God leads to a mind in opposition to God. Therefore, an aspect of your transformation is really linked to your mind being renewed. And how does this renewal happen? There's so much that hinges on your mind being renewed. How does, how does that happen? This is why I like the Bible, right? Because if you dig and you dig, you're going to find connections, right, all over the place, right? The word that Paul uses in the Greek for renewal, right, in the Romans uh, verse, he uses again in Titus. And let's look at that one. And I think that's the answer of how our minds get renewed, right? Stay with me. Titus 3, 5, he saved us not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do the renewal. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is the one that does the renewing. Is that not good news? Is that not good news this morning? You don't have to do it. The Spirit does it when we submit and we yield to Him, right? How does He do it, right? The natural question would be, well, how does He do it? 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Try to get, I try to have all the bases covered for you this morning. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them blinded the minds of the unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. When you come to Jesus, that act in and of itself is a result of the Holy Spirit working to lift the blindness that had you rejecting him for all those years. Had you rejecting him for all those years. The Holy Spirit works to lift barriers, right, to allow you to see, right? When you join, right, when you come to the feet of Jesus, you're not like just joining some like Christian social club. There are cosmic, supernatural things happening, right? To free you from the bondage you didn't even know you were under, right? So this morning, my plea to you, one of my pleas to you is don't take your salvation for granted. There's too much happening in the background to help you see. There's too much happening in the background to help you see. Yes? The Holy Spirit does the work of renewing our minds when we submit to his authority and his leading. Only the Holy Spirit can delve deep into our minds, right, to restore the broken parts, the scars left behind. The ignorance and rejection of all things good, only the Holy Spirit can operate in that function. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The renewal that happens when we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Good? Strength. Let's go to strength. We're there. We're in the home stretch strength. This is an interesting image that I chose, but you'll see why in a second. Strength, seemingly the most simple for us to understand. Strength refers to what? Like it's our capacity to withstand force, right? Pressure. It's the state of being strong and uh, in will and physical. Uh, let's look at Jeremiah. Let's go back to our brother Jeremiah in that same verse, 17, yeah? This is the beginning of that proclamation. We looked at it with the heart, and now he has something to say, right? God has something to say about strength. Thus says the Lord, cursed, you can read that word also in context, miserable, right? Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Cursed is the man who makes flesh his strength. Being strong in the world is often linked to our own personal capabilities, right, and capacities, right? Being strong is dependent in this world on what we bring to the table. But here's the thing. Here's the thing about the Bible, right? When God calls us to love him with all of our strength, he's asking us to do something that he already knows requires his participation. He already knows that it requires his participation, right? You can't do it on your own. And one of the themes that runs through the book of Psalms and a lot of the Old Testament is that God alone is your strength. I just threw a, like, four ver like four verses up here, um, but there are many. You've seen these before, yes? Uh, Psalm 46.1, God is our refuge and our strength, our ever-present help in trouble. Psalm 28, 7 and 8, the Lord is my strength and my shield. Psalm 118.14, the Lord is my strength and my defense. Habakkuk 3.19, the Lord is my strength. You'll find many, many more, right? Over and over in his word, God reminds us that he alone is the source of our strength. 
the book of Judges introduces us to the last judge, right? The judges were just uh, these temporary rulers in the absence of a king. And Judges 13 introduces us to the last one. His name was Samson. Anybody know Samson? Uh, it's like, uh, what is it? The, they say the, the Israeli, uh, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, Hercules, right? Um, Samson, right? We all know the story of Samson. But let me give you a quick fire uh, summary. Samson comes to Israel at the time when Israel, the Bible says, was doing evil in the sight of the Lord again. Those people didn't get it. They kept, kept going, kept going. But God always sent deliverance, right? So Samson comes during this time. Angel of the Lord comes to Samson's mom um, and foretells of his birth. He tells her that he will be a Nazarite. A Nazarite just means someone that's uh, consecrated to the service of the Lord. The angel says he will be a Nazarite till his death. And then he says, hey, but don't, don't touch his hair. Just leave his hair alone. <laughs> Let it grow. Don't worry about it. Don't touch his hair. God meant, right, for his strength to be connected to his hair, right, the source of his strength. Um, but then Samson grows up to be not that nice of a guy, right? He was promiscuous. He was brash. He was arrogant. Um, uh, he, uh, at one point in the narrative, this is a funny point in the narrative, he tells his parents, hey, um, uh, oh, and a part I didn't tell you that at the time Israel was under Philistine, right? Captivity, they were under the Philistines, right? Samson one day comes and so it says, Mom, Dad, I saw this Philistine girl. Go get her for me. Like, I want to marry her. His parents are like, what? <laughs> His parents are like, isn't there a good, nice girl here? Like, isn't it, you know, one of our people? And Samson goes, no, 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 no. She's right in my eyes. She's right in my eyes. A few chapters later, after Samson's death, uh, the Bible says that Israel was without king, right, because they uh, decided to do what was right in their eyes, right? Samson was like almost like a foreshadowing of this, right? She's right in my eyes, he says. So they bring her. Uh, she ends up dying at the hands of the Philistines with her father. Right after that, uh, he hooks up with a prostitute. After that, he lays eyes on Delilah, and Delilah, we know, was his demise, right? She seduces him into saying the source of his strength, and right after that, he's caught by the Philistines, hair's cut, and uh, really a tragic end, although there's redemption in that end, all right? I, I encourage you to continue reading that story. Let's look at uh, a passage that I sent out. All throughout Samson's life, he knew very well that his strength came from God. He never doubted the prophecy, and his actions always spoke to a supernatural source of power, right? The problem with Samson was that he didn't always recognize where that strength came from. He didn't always give it credit, right? Let's read. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and put out his hand and took it, and with it he struck 1,000 men. And Samson said, this was his song right after that. This is his song. With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, have I struck a thousand men. And there's no mention of God in that song. Right? That's our problem sometimes. What God has done, we take credit for. We attribute our successes, our strengths, our abilities, right? Our intellect, our resolve, right? Until, like Samson, you're caught between two pillars, right? weakened to the point that all you have is a cry to God. All you have is a final cry to God. And in his mercy, in his mercy, he hears, right? Why is that? 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I don't think I put this one. Oh, I did. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power or strength is made perfect in weakness, right? It's that paradoxical theology of God. The first shall be last, the weak shall be strong, yeah? Amen. So we made it through the four. <laughs> we made it through the four. Why are these four important to the vision of Park Slope Christian Tabernacle? I believe that the heart, mind, soul, right, and strength become the tools and the target of our vision. Yes? Become the tools and the target of our vision. Quickly, the tools, right? Any vision that's embarked upon by a church, by our church body, must have us locked in with our souls, with our hearts, with our minds, with our strength. We must be locked in, right? 
if we're going to accomplish what God has for us, right? If we're going to be effective stewards of what God has entrusted us. How are they the target, though? Right? How are they the target? Before we finalize our vision over the next few weeks, we're going to really get to the nitty-gritty, right, of writing this stuff out. We're, gonna, we're, we're at the finish line. We're here, right? But before we do all of that, we already know something about the vision. We already know, right? Our vision is predicated, right, is based on our collective belief that the gospel is true. Is that right? That Jesus Christ is God made flesh, come into the world to save the world from sin and wrath. And so if we know that, and if we believe that, then the impulse is to share that with as many people as possible, yes? So our first target and our first aim is always the salvation of souls. That's the first thing. But here's what God was showing me when I was writing this and what he has for you this morning. What makes our vision holistic, and it's the theme of this whole message, is that we understand as a church that we can't just leave people after the sinner's prayer, right? We can't just lead them to the altar, have them make a confession of faith, and then leave them there. The vision is holistic when we understand that we have to be tending to the other areas of our lives, tending to these other areas, right, that lead to human flourishing. And human flourishing for the believer, I think I wrote this up here, Human flourishing for the believer has nothing to do with affluence, but it has everything to do with wholeness. There's some of us that need to be made whole this morning, right? We need to be tending to the other areas of lives, right? Heart, right? Mind and strength. We need to be tending to each other. While God takes the forefront of the restoration of these areas in our lives, there's a vital human component that God requires his church to partake in. You see, embedded right into love your neighbor that's the second part of the passage embedded into love your neighbor it's care for his or her suffering yeah a holistic vision rests on the belief that love is more an action than a sentiment you know at the founding of our country uh there was uh, several different political philosophies that we could have taken right in the founding of the country one of them was uh, liberalism right and not liberal like democrat or like left liberal like uh the political philosophy, big L, that just, had, that just means the rights of man, right? We were really interested at the beginning of this country in the rights of each man, right? Because we were coming from the tyranny of Britain. Um, but one of the founding principles of that philosophy was individualism, the individual. Now, I, I think that individual, individualism has crept too much into the church, right? And it's countered what the initial church was all about, they call this sometimes the Acts 2 church. Have you ever read Acts? Acts 2 talked about how the church was with each other. How did the church start? A spirit of community. There was communal living with each other. There was sharing. There was tending to each other. I just think we've gotten too far from that model, yeah? We need to be tending to each other. We know, we know, like, we know men and women that have come right through those doors and have come up here and have gave their lives to Jesus, but but their hearts are still troubled, right? Because they've come with baggage. They've come out of uh, destructive relationships, right? Impoverished states, right? Their hearts are heavy. We need to be tending to that. Men, this morning, are we tending to each other, right? Us men, we like to walk around thinking that we're strong. We always say, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. Truth is, we're not always good. The truth is, we're not always good. Are we tending to each other? Women, you're a little better at this, but are we tending to each other to see how we're doing? When uh, a few weeks back, my wife and I and the kids came back from California, it was a really great time. Uh, but when we landed, my wife was like very ill. She had like ear infection, throat infection, eye infection, like she was jacked up. And um, some of the women in the church took out the time, those that knew, I'm sure a lot of people didn't know, uh, some of the women that knew took out the time to text her, just a text, hey, how are you? And uh, a couple other women reached out to me by email because they didn't have her contact. And I got to tell you, like me and my wife, uh, born and raised in the church, I can't tell you what a positive effect that had on the household and how touched she was that women took out the time to tend to her, right? To tend to her in her time of need. She was bedridden for like three days. Are we tending to each other? People, are we tending uh, to people outside of our circles, right? Outside of our cliques. And let me tell you something, that this message is as much for me as it is for you, right? Are we paying attention to people on the periphery, right? 
to people that don't make it to our circles, right? Have we considered maybe like sitting in other places? I'm always sitting right here. Have we considered moving around, right? right? We want to be tending to people outside of our circles, outside of our cliques. We can be clicky, man. I can be clicky. But God, deliver us from that. Deliver us from that spirit, O oh God, and help us to see. Help us to discern, Lord. There are men and women that come to the church and they sit down and week after week they think, is this the day that someone's going to come up to me? Church, <laughs> let them wonder no more. You should be tending to each other. You should be tending to each other. Starting with me. Starting with me. The vision is holistic because we know that God cares about our mental faculties. He cares about our souls, right? He cares about our hearts. He cares about our mental faculties, right? That's why I'm so excited about some of the initiatives that Pastor Maribel and Pastor JC have in the pipeline, right? They have education initiatives to, to work on the minds of the community because we know, right, that the mind, God cares about the mind. We should care about the mind. Mental health. Can I talk about it for like a second? Mental health, right? Some statistics have like one in five New Yorkers suffer with a mental illness. Nothing to be ashamed about. Everything to be talking about it, though, right? We should be talking about it. And, and let me disavow you of the thought that that only affects people in the church. I mean, people outside. No. There was a pastor last year in California who took his life. Young pastor left behind three young boys. Mental health. Are we tending to each other to refer these people to specialists? It's okay. It's okay to get special help from doctors. It's okay. God means for this. God means, right? He gives, he gives certain people the capacity to help you, right? If we were praying all our illnesses away and not going to Dr. Ariel, it doesn't make much sense, right? Pray. Use the medicine. Yes? We should be thinking about these things. Are we tending to each other? Listen, I'm almost done. I work as a police officer eight and a half hours out of five days a week, right? I'm looking for a new job if anybody uh, has any openings. Um, but, uh, but I work as a police officer, and while I was writing this portion, I kept thinking about the nine officers that committed suicide over the last month and a half. Nine officers. This is an epidemic in the department, right? And I just kept thinking, was anyone tending to them, right? Was there a church? I'm sure they had family that loved them. But were there more people that were getting around them to tend to them? Nine suicides. The department has uh, this initiative that it started a couple years back. Are you okay? Right? The letter R, the letter U, okay. It's plastered over all our lockers. It's a good initiative, but we're just really bad in like putting it into practice. Police officers are very stoic. Like everything's fine. The church, though, should be good asking each other, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? We should care to tend to each other. This is the God way. Yes, yes, yes. The holistic vision, and I'm coming to a close. I'm coming to a close. The holistic vision is one that considers the whole person. The teenage mom, the elderly, the poor, the drug addict, the domestic abuse survivor. God means for all of these people to be whole. And what a privilege it is to partake in that restoration process. Right? And I want to leave you with this as the musicians come. I think we'll stop here. As the musicians come up and play a little something, jazz if you want, whatever you want. Um, uh, you know, when I was penning this sermon, you know, I kept uh, going back and forth and just like, God, forgive me. Forgive me for all the missed opportunities uh, to tend. Right? Forgive me for all the missed opportunities to see how my brother is doing right? And, uh, but but, but I, I, I got up from that prayer with a new resolve, with a new resolve, right? Our vision should care about tending to people's different needs in different areas, right? In the Old Testament, there was two uses for the term to tend, right? Tend or tending. You were either tending sheep, right? You were tending flock, or you were tending a lamp to make sure that fire kept burning, Here's what I saw with that. The vision of Park Slope Christian Tabernacle is holistic because we have the awesome privilege of leading God's flock to salvation. And once they are in possession of that which Jesus died for, we have the awesome responsibility as a church to help manifest growth, right, in their lives to keep that light shining. That is the target of our vision, to help people, to lead people to wholeness through Jesus Christ. 
There are people here that need tending to this morning. I know that. And there are people here that maybe feel like they should be better at tending to people, right? Let's, uh, let's read this last verse. John 10.10. 10. I don't have that in the slides, right? John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and life abundantly. Stand, stand with me. The life of abundance that God promises really has little to do with like material gain, right? Even though stability is good, right? Financial stability is good. But the life of abundance that God offers is a heart that is healed, a soul that is saved, a mind that is sound, and a strength that's renewed daily. We're going to open up, right, the altar for any of those that feel like they need tending to this morning. For any of those that feel like they've been lacking in their tending to others, the vision will only come about, will only bear fruit, right? If it's founded on these principles, if it's founded on these key areas of our lives, God means so much for the church. God wants so much for this church. To go beyond, like, the mundane, right? To go beyond the everyday, yeah? Right? We need to be getting in each other's lives, right? Not like, not like violating, right, people, right? But, but we need to be asking each other, hey, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? God cares about these areas of our lives. God cares about these areas of our lives. Yes, Heavenly Father. Praise God. I, we don't want to just leave this moment that God wants to do in your life. You are doing something in your heart right now. The altar is open. Pray with you. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. Also, today could be the day that you confess and say, Lord, I need to work. I need you, Lord God, to speak to me. And I need to make a decision to acknowledge that I need help. The better you come right here as we pray with you and pray for you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. God is doing something in your heart. God wants to change something in your mind and your soul. God is fighting for you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your presence, Lord. We thank you for the word that just changes our perspective, changes our mind, Lord. Father, we love you, Father. And we are grateful for your word that just speaks life, Father. 
a word that just touches and messes us up and just focuses back to you, my Lord. Father, I pray for healing in our hearts tonight, Lord God. I pray for renewal, Lord God. I pray that, God, that we would be to love you with all our heart, mind, and soul, Lord God, and our strength, Father. I pray for everyone in this room, Lord God, that they would not just look at this as just a regular Sunday, but a Sunday that would change our future, a word that would change our journey. So, God, we are thankful and we're grateful for what you're doing with our church. Thank you for the word, Father. We're so grateful. We humble ourselves before you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give God a clap, boy, for what he's doing. You may be seated as we collect our offering. I would say that my brother Joey and I and our boy Gabriel, once a month probably we go out and we have lunch together or, or dinner together. I love how we text each other and say, hey, is it good for your wives <laughs> to allow us to go out and hang out? And our wives are so graceful and to say, go hang out with your brothers. We come together and we hang out and we talk about everything. We sharpen each other up because we need each other. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you for being there for me. Praise the Lord.